rough out there, but we'll uh, just trust the Lord to take care of us, and uh, certainly glad you're here tonight. Thank you for coming out this evening, and uh, we're going to go ahead and turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 tonight. If you'd like to go ahead and turn there with me, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, and uh, just as this morning, as I was mentioning in the book of Jeremiah, uh, where the prophet uses a lot of uh, word pictures, if you will, he uses a lot of things to kind of help us uh, understand what the Lord is trying to say to us here in the book of 1 Peter, uh, we find that uh, there is a lot of word pictures again. Uh, there's a lot of comparisons. There's a lot of things that the Bible even tells us that we as Christians are like, uh, that we as people are like. And so I want us to look at that tonight. And as we look at it, ask, us, ask ourselves, you know, what the Lord would have us to learn where we are in our relationship with the Lord, and where the Lord wants us to go as well. And so we'll look at that tonight. We're going to begin in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25, I'll read it to you there. It says, For we were as sheep going astray, but are now returned to the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. And so the first comparison that it says here is it says that we were as sheep going astray. And we talked about this morning a little bit how the Bible said in Psalm 100 that we are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. And we understand tonight that the Bible in several places uses the analogy or the picture, the illustration, if you will, of us being the sheep and him being the shepherd. And it says here that before we came to Christ, before we were saved, it says here that we were as sheep going astray. Everyone just going their own direction, doing their own thing, trying to go through life and accomplish something without the direction of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it says here that Peter says, we were as sheep going astray. Uh, hopefully tonight, if you're here and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then now you realize that we do have a shepherd. The last part of that verse says that we are returned unto the shepherd and the bishop or the overseer of our souls. You know, we need to understand that tonight. You know, we mentioned this morning that sheep, are really, they're kind of senseless animals. They're, they're directionless. They can't really determine what is best for themselves, and so that's why they really need the shepherd there. And we find the Bible tells us, in fact, Jesus Christ himself, in the Gospels, he says that he is the good shepherd. He is the one that is there to lead us and to guide us and to care for us and provide for us, and he chooses to do all of that. And one of the stories we find over in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus gives the story of a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. And he says that if 90 and 9 are in the fold, but he's missing that one sheep, he said he'll go and he'll search and he'll look for that sheep and he'll bring it back. He'll care for it. He'll protect it. Do you know tonight we need to understand that Jesus Christ does that very thing for us. He cares for us. He wants to bring us in. He wants to, to be there for us and to provide for us. Uh, just as this morning we looked at Psalm 23 for just a, a brief moment where the Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It says, He leadeth me beside still waters. He leadeth me to the green pastures. He provides for me all that I need. Well, we understand tonight that the Lord is our shepherd. And He wants to be there for us. He wants to provide for us. He wants to care for us. But before we come to know Him or when we try to do our own thing, the Bible says we are like sheep going astray. I won't talk about it very much because we did mention this morning how uh, on our own, you know, the sheep, many times they get themselves in trouble. Uh, the shepherd is there saying, I'm ready to care for you. I'm ready to provide for you. I'm ready to protect you. But so many times the sheep want to wander off in their own direction and take things into their own hands and they get themselves into trouble. So many times we're like that, but we need to do as this verse says and return to the shepherd and the bishop or the overseer of our souls. But I want to give you another picture here tonight. The Bible gives us in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. Let's go back to verses 1 and 2 of 1 Peter chapter 2. It says there, Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Not only does the Bible tell us here in 1 Peter that we were as sheep going astray, but what does it tell us in verse 2 of chapter 2? It says, as newborn babes, 
We are to desire the milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Now, we talked a moment ago about the nature of the sheep. The sheep are kind of senseless. They're directionless. They don't really, they're not really able to, to do on their own, and so they have need of a shepherd. But let's think for a moment about the nature of a newborn child. You know, I've shared with you before, one of the greatest miracles I believe I've seen in my life is the birth of our children. But from the very moment that they're born, they're, they're helpless. They're dependent upon you. They're looking to you for their food, for their warmth, for their health, for everything. They're looking to you. And that's a wonderful opportunity as a parent. But also the Bible says that when we come to know Christ, when we first begin in that relationship with him, it compares us to those newborn babes. It compares us to that young and that helpless child that needs help from others, that needs the help of the Lord, that needs the, the milk and the nourishment of the word of God so that we can grow in that. And so we see tonight that Peter uses this illustration that as we come to Christ, we are as newborn babes and we need to grow. You know, I want you to think about the, the needs of a newborn. I believe that, first of all, we understand it says here that a newborn needs food. It says here that they desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. Now, most of you know, and I'm sure that you do, but a newborn, they, they have a way of telling you when they want some food. And it's not always pleasant, you know. And they, they let out cries and screams and all these sorts of things, and they let you know that they want some food. They have the desire for that food. And the truth is tonight is that Peter is saying, look, just as a baby desires that milk so that it can grow just as a baby has to have that milk, we need to have that same desire for the word of God so that we can grow, so that we can be strengthened in our faith, so that we can move forward in the word of God and what God has for us. We need that, but we have to have it if we're going to move forward. That's why the word of God is important for us to, to read it, for us to listen to it, for us to, to be in the house of God where it's being preached and taught so that we can learn and grow in the word of God. And so we see here that that's a very important part and that the Bible tells us to do that. But not only is food important, but fellowship is important. You say, preacher, what do you mean? And you don't, you don't have a newborn baby around crowds or whatever. But, you know, one of the things I read is it said that in studies that were done, in babies that were born premature, in babies that were in incubators and things such as that, the babies who had a parent who would come in and, and reach in and touch them or talk to them and have communication with them and said those babies had a much greater chance of survival. Why? Because we as human beings, we thrive on contact with one another. We thrive on being around one another. You know, this past Sunday or this past, sorry, Wednesday night, we talked about the aspect of fellowship in our Christian lives. We talked about the importance of being around other believers. If we're going to grow in the word of God, if we're going to grow in our spiritual walk, then it is vital that we be around others and that we develop that relationship, that we have that love, that nurture, that care that others can give along the way as we move towards spiritual maturity. But not only do we see that tonight there in chapter 2, but now we're going to skip back to chapter 1 there. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14, it gives us another illustration. It says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So not only does Peter tell us that we are like sheep going astray, and he tells us that we're like newborn babes, but what does he tell us here? He says that we are as obedient children, fashioning ourselves according to the former lust, or not fashioning ourselves according to the former lust in our ignorance. In other words, he says that as children of God, we have a choice to make, and that choice is to be obedient children to follow the commands of God, to do as God has told us to do. You know, need to understand tonight that obedience is a learned behavior. You know, children, many times, they will not naturally obey. 
Uh, children, a lot of times, they naturally want to do what they want to do, not what you want them to do. They have to be taught to obey. They have to be taught to submit themselves to the parent or to the authority. And it is a learned behavior. And so we see here that it tells us to be as obedient children. You know what? I'm going to tell you tonight that doesn't happen in the natural realm, but that doesn't happen in the spiritual realm by itself. It happens because we make a choice to obey God, because we make a choice to do what God tells us to do. You know, as we're like the newborn babe and we're reading in the word of God and we're desiring the word of God and we're soaking up the word of God. When we come to something that maybe rubs us wrong, when we come to something that maybe tells us we should be doing something that we're not, or maybe that we shouldn't be doing something that we are, then we need to be as what? As obedient children. We need to say, Lord, you know what? It's not my will, but your will that I want to do. It's yeah. not about what I want to do, but it's about what you want me to do. And we need to follow God's will and God's plan for our lives. And so I encourage you tonight to, to make yourself, to determine tonight that you will be as obedient children. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus, our greatest example over in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8, it said that he learned obedience. He submitted himself to the will of his heavenly father. In fact, we've seen many times there in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before his death, he prayed and he said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass. But he said, not my will, but thine be done. What was Jesus himself saying? He was saying, Father, I will be an obedient child unto your will. Do you know what God wants us to do? He wants to be an obedient child unto his will. He wants us to be just as Peter has told us here, to be obedient children. And it says they're not fashioning ourselves after the former lust of this world, but being conformed and being following the example of God, being holy because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. We're supposed to live according to how God wants us to live, not according to how the world wants to live. You know, we have that choice to make tonight. Either we can obey or we can choose to disobey. We can follow what God tells us or we can choose to turn away from what God tells us. And we must make sure that we're following and we're obeying God's will and God's plan for our lives. You know, the Bible tells us over in uh, the book of Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2, where it's talking about submitting ourselves, giving ourselves, uh, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. In the second verse there, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, it says, don't let this world determine how you're going to live or who you're going to be or what you're going to do, but allow the Lord and his word to determine what we're going to be and what we're going to do. And so we find here that he tells us that we are as obedient children. I hope that as you look at yourself in your spiritual walk with the Lord tonight, you can say, I am striving to be that obedient child. I'm striving to follow the Lord's will and the Lord's plan for my life. But not only does he tell us that, as we go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, down in verses 11 and 12, he tells us something else that he compares us to. Verse 11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as what? As strangers and pilgrims. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Oh, we understand there that it tells us, Paul, in fact, he uh, addresses them, he said, as strangers and pilgrims. You say, preacher, what exactly does that mean? That word stranger there can also be translated a foreigner, a someone that is from a different land. I don't know if you tonight, if you've ever been in a different land or a different nation, but it's kind of strange really at first. When you go somewhere and no one speaks your language and no one understands and everyone is different, maybe they're wearing different clothing and they look different from you, it's kind of an odd thing. But you know what? The Bible says here that we as believers in God, we as followers of Jesus Christ, he says that really in this world, we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. You know, I think that's very important because I believe that, you think about it, if you are in a strange country, if you are in a foreign country, then chances are you're going to look different than everybody else. 
Chances are you're going to sound different than everybody else. Chances are you're going to really live and, and like different things and do different things than everybody else. Why is that? Because you are different. You're a stranger. You're a foreigner. You know what? The Bible tells us that we are in this world, but we are not of this world. We talked about it before. We as Christians have a, a heavenly citizenship. Our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're on our way to that place that God has prepared for us. And really in this world, we are to live as strangers. There's supposed to be something different about us than just the rest of the world. You know, I've shared with you several times, I think it's so important when Jesus was on trial, when Jesus was before the judges, and when Peter was standing outside and warming himself by the fire, and Jesus had told Peter, he said, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me three times before the morning, before the cock crows. And Peter said, oh, Lord, I would never deny you. Of course, we know how the story goes. A different people came up to Peter and said, hey, you're one of them. You're one of Jesus' followers. I know that you are. And Peter said, no, I'm not one of his followers. And another person came up and said, you're, you're with him. You're, you're one of Jesus' followers. And Peter said, no, no, you're mistaken. That's not me. A third time, someone came up to Peter and said, I know you're one of Jesus' followers. And do you remember what the verse said? It said, your speech, your language gives you away. In other words, the way that you talk is different from everyone else. Do you know what it said just after that? It said Peter denied it and he went away what? Cursing. He changed the way he was talking. Why? To try to prove that he wasn't one of those people. You say, preacher, why is that important? It's important because he was different because of God. He was a different person. You know what? People should be able to look at your life and at mine and say there's something different. There's something different about the way they act. There's something different about the way they talk. There's something different about the things that they do. They seem to be different. You know, I've said it before, and I know when I worked with young people, this is always a struggle because young people want to fit in. They want to be like others. They don't want to be the, the strange one or the different one necessarily. But you know what? The Bible tells us in this world that we are to be strangers. We're to be different. We're supposed to, to stand out from the rest of the crowd. But not only does it say that they are as strangers, but notice the second word there. He says, and pilgrims. You say, well, preacher, doesn't that just mean the same thing? No, it doesn't. The word stranger, it means a, a foreigner, someone from a different country. The word pilgrim, it means a foreigner, but it means someone who is on a journey. A someone who has left their home. They've left their homeland. They've left their place of comfort, but they are on a journey to another place. And you know, really, that's how we are to live as Christians here in this world. Yes, we were born here in this world. Yes, we may have one time had the, the habits and the things of this world, but now we are a stranger. Now we are different, and we are headed towards a place that God has prepared for us. Last week, we looked at Abraham over at Hebrews chapter 11. And one of the things it said about Abraham is it said that he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. You know what? That should be our desire tonight as well. We should be looking for another place. You know, there's an old song we sing in our hymn books that talks about this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I hope that you could say that tonight as your testimony. I hope that you could truthfully say this world is not home to me, but my home is somewhere beyond the blue. The place that I'm looking for is the home that God is preparing for me. Over in the book of Titus chapter 2, it talks about us looking for the returning of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking for that, that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That needs to be our desire tonight. We don't need to get very comfortable, if you will, here in this world. We don't need to be adjusted to this world or the things of this world, but we need to be looking to that home, to that place that God has for us. Peter says here that we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. But then the final thing I want us to see is there in 1 Peter chapter 2 as well. If you will, go back with me up to verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, it said, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, an holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 
So what is the last illustration we see? It says that we are as lively stones. That word really can be translated as living stones. We are living stones. Now you may say tonight, preacher, what in the world does it mean that the Lord says I am a living stone? You know, over in the book of Romans, as we mentioned a moment ago, it says that we are to be a living sacrifice. In other words, we give ourselves to God. We give our lives to him, but not in death, but in life. We're still living, and we're supposed to be living for him. Here it says that we are to be living stones, and it says, built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God by Jesus Christ. I want you to notice a couple of things about stones, and then we'll be done. First of all, we understand that stones are for building. The stones are for building. In fact, it amazes me that you can go to some places of the world and you find buildings that were built thousands of years ago. And some of them are still standing. Some of them still are very beautiful. Why? Because they were built from stone. Because they were built very solidly. They were built very firmly and they still stand. You know, I believe the Bible tells us here that we are to be living stones to stand as a building for God. To be a representation of God here in this world. So that others can look to us just as they would look to some stone or something and say that person is standing and representing God. You know the Bible tells us over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It talks about us being the temple of God. You know it's important tonight that we live our lives with the understanding. With the acknowledgement that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That God lives and dwells within us. And we want to be as much of a building as we can be. In Sunday school just a few weeks ago, we looked at Solomon's building of the temple. And we looked at all of the elaborate things that went into that. All of the gold and the silver and the jewels and the precious stones that went into the building of the temple. And you say, preacher, why is that important? Because we want our lives to bring honor and glory to God. We want ourselves, our bodies in this world to bring honor and glory to God just as the temple did. Just as any place that is prepared for our God to live and to dwell. But not only are stones used for building, but also stones are used for a memorial. Uh, to remember something. In fact, if we were to go back to Joshua chapter 4 in the Old Testament as Joshua was leading the people of Israel into the promised land. As they crossed the Jordan River, he told them God had commanded him and he commanded the people. He said, one person from every tribe is to gather a stone as they cross through the Jordan River. And as after they passed the Jordan River, they placed those stones and they built them up. And they said, some said, well, what are these stones for? And the Lord said, these are for a memorial. They're stones of memorial so that when your children or your grandchildren ask, Mom, Dad, what are those stones for? You could say those are stones that remind us when God moved and God took, brought us across the Jordan River. When God brought us into the promised land. When God moved and worked in our lives. You say, Preacher, why is that important to me today? Because we need to make sure that our lives are a memorial to Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that those who come behind us, whether it's our children, our grandchildren, our family members, our friends, maybe our co-workers, that they can point to us and say, that was a person who lived.